There's a, uh, a tradition in the United States of uh, journalists occasionally going beyond just a routine description of contemporary events and conducting extensive thoroughgoing research into problems and writing um, writing about the problems in the United States in a way that is so gripping that it shapes uh, political discourse and so on. Uh, one thinks of Upton Sinclair 100 years ago, the book The Jungle, uh, Michael Harrington's <laughs> book The Other America 50 years ago. A leading exemplar of this tradition today is our speaker today, Sasha Abramsky. Sasha is a uh, freelance journalist He's published articles in most of the leading uh, outlets, The Nation, Rolling Stone, New York Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and the list goes on and on. Um, he's written three books on crime and criminal justice system. He's written a book about hunger in America, and most recently, his book, The American Way of Poverty, uh, talks about, give, gives illustrations about people's actual experience with poverty, but goes beyond that to talk about the, the causes, the nature of poverty, and what we can do about it. I've used this book in various uh, book study groups, and it's absolutely riveting. It's like reading a novel. You can't put it down. Brilliantly written, and yet extremely uh, challenging intellectually. Uh, in addition to his journalism and research, he teaches courses on nonfiction writing at, in the writing program at uh, UC Davis, and he's a research fellow at the Center for Research for Poverty Research on campus. In addition, he serves as a guest speaker in courses around campus. Certainly, he's uh, given talks in courses in sociology, American studies, and, and other other departments. So I am just thrilled to have Sasha here. And I'm eager to hear about this contemporary, his current research project and what he has to say. Please welcome Sasha Abram. Well, thank you all for inviting me. And Jim, thank you for that more than generous introduction. I think what he was really trying to tell you is that I'm an enemy of the people. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I thought I'd do today is talk to you about some themes from the last book, the one that Jim mentioned to you, The American Way of Poverty, but also bring up to speed to my upcoming book, which is called Jumping at Shadows, and it's about the rise of a demagogic, fear-based political culture. And it seems to me that the two sort of come together quite nicely. Um, now, one of the reasons I was so delighted to accept this invitation is it seems to me that a political moment like this goes through a trajectory. And that when a new leader comes in, the normal approach is, well, we'll try and work out ways to cooperate, even if we disagree. And then if the cooperation proves to be impossible, at some point you move from cooperation to opposition. And then if the opposition becomes impossible, at some point you move from opposition to active resistance. The amazing thing about this moment is that trajectory happened in about 10 seconds. <laughs> but as soon as Donald Trump got elected, it became absolutely obvious that we were in a historically unique moment. And that it created all sorts of obligations, not just for progressives, but for anybody thinking and caring about how the country was functioning. And that it was a moment of tremendous peril. But also, if enough people organize, if gatherings like this are willing to come out on an afternoon and devote time to thinking about the moment, thinking about what's gone wrong and what can be done to fix it, then at the same time as it being a moment of peril, it's actually a moment of tremendous opportunity to reshape and rethink our political agenda, not just for a month or a year or an election season, but for the next several decades. So, what I thought I'd do is start by just telling a little bit about 2008, the Great Recession. I began writing my book, The American Way of Poverty, in the shadow of this extraordinary collapse, this moment where the economic certainties of an order that had existed for 40 or 50 years was crumbling around us. The economy was wobbling, the housing market had collapsed, the stock market had plummeted, 
it looked for a moment like the banking system itself would fail. Now, I spent three years, that period surrounding 08, and immediately afterwards, researching the book and interviewing people around the country about what the economic chaos and the economic uncertainty and the slide to poverty meant for them as individuals in this community. When the book came out, came out about 2012, 2013, I can't remember the exact year. When the book came out, 2008 was very much still an immediate present legacy. You didn't have to look very hard to find people whose homes were still in foreclosure or who had lost their homes already. You didn't have to look very hard to find massive levels of unemployment in states like California or Nevada or Michigan or pretty much any other state around the country. You didn't have to look very hard to find people who lost their jobs, lost their savings, cashed out their retirement plans, and were downwardly mobile in a very, very active way. <coughs> So when I first began giving the variation on this talk, it was very easy for audiences to connect. Because I'd be talking about all of these uncertainties, and a goodly part of the audience was experiencing them directly. And that was the first permutation of this talk. And then the headline numbers began getting better. We started seeing fairly regular increases in employment, fairly regular decreases in the unemployment rate. The housing market began recovering, and in states like California, it began absolutely booming. Stock market started creating record upon record upon record. And economic growth returned. So when you just looked at the headline numbers, about five years out from the Great Recession, the headline numbers were looking pretty good. So I had to give a second variation on the talk. I'd start off with conversation about how the numbers were improving, and then because nobody wanted me to just come and get good news, I said, but things aren't looking so good. And I'd explain why despite the numbers improving, we still have one in six Americans living in poverty. We still have one in six Americans on food stamps, or otherwise chronically food insecure. We still have tens of millions of Americans without good stable access to health coverage, health insurance. We still had a housing epidemic, a homelessness crisis in cities like Los Angeles or here in Sacramento, Davis. And that was the second permutation, just explaining how despite the good news, things still weren't all that rosy. And now we come to the third permutation. This weird, strange, dangerous, demagogic political moment. And the third permutation is how does a country with headline numbers as good as America's, a country at the peak of its political power, its diplomatic power, and its military power, a country which has more economic resources than any other country in human history, how does that country fall prey to the politics of fear and the politics of demagogy in a way that we saw in the last election season and in a way that we're now living with the consequences of today? How did a country that wasn't in the midst of demographic, or economic, or political, or military collapse vote for a demagogue? A man who looked at Muslims and said, they're the reason for your problem. Who looked at Mexicans and said, they're criminals, I'll build a wall against them. Who looked at the disabled and could do no better than to mock them. How does somebody who goes from one moral outrage to another moral outrage to another moral outrage pick up a critical political momentum? Because we've seen this kind of stuff in history before. There's nothing unique about it, but it normally occurs at a moment of complete national collapse. Without overdoing the comparison, we understand when and how Hitler came to power. He came to power amidst hyperinflation a devastated economy, massive levels of unemployment, national humiliation, the aftermath of the Versailles Treaty, and so on and so forth. America didn't have that. It had problems post-08, but it didn't have a Weimar Germany kind of feel for it. And yet, somehow, Donald Trump uses all of the mechanisms of fear and anxiety and insecurity to carve out a road to power. So how does that happen? The answer, I think, lies in large part 
in a combination of things. First of them is the economic anxiety that was present not just from 2008, but going back decades, that affected critical numbers of people, especially at the bottom of the economy. And the second part was this petty dish of fear and anxiety created by terrorism, created by that rapid cultural and technological changes, sexual identity changes, all the things that have been occurring over the last 30, 40, 50 years, and that for many people are scary. When you put it all together, the cultural changes, the rise of global terror networks, and economic insecurity, suddenly you have a combination of events that creates a fear-based political culture, a rumor-based political culture, a political culture defined by a belief in conspiracy, all of which is a prerequisite for the rise of demagoguery. Now in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the economics than on the other things. If you wanted me to talk about all the other anxieties and fears in the culture, come back and hear me in a few months when my new book comes out in September. But for now, let's talk about economics. So here's the thing. Those headline numbers I gave you a while back, the unemployment rate going down, economic growth going up, housing market going up, and so on and so forth, that's all true. If you go back to 2008-9, unemployment rate in California peaked in double digits. It was over 10%. To our east in Nevada, it was about 12%. In the industrial Rust Belt areas, again, 12-13% unemployment. Vast numbers of people were unemployed. If you look at the unemployment rate today, it's half that, less than half that. Nationally, it's about 4.3, 4.4%. Hasn't been this low in nearly 20 years. California went from budget deficits that were seen as being intractable to budget surpluses. Went from cutting and cutting and cutting schools, public transport, other necessary infrastructure, to being able to grow them again. All of that's good news. And yet, that stubborn poverty remains. So yes, we have 4.3% unemployment nationally, but we have 14% poverty. And that's by an extraordinarily cautious measure of poverty. Government defines poverty as $11,000 a year for an individual, $23,000 a year for a family of four. It doesn't take account of high housing costs, for example, in a state like California. You put all of that back in, instead of getting 15% economic insecurity, you head up towards 25 30% in many, many states. With child poverty, we do even worse. Child poverty, we go from having one in six being in poverty, which is the national average, to one in five when you're talking about the population under the age of 18. One in five kids lives in poverty in America. You go to Detroit or New Orleans, you're looking at one in three African-American kids living in poverty. Just extraordinary numbers. You look at deep poverty, which is half the poverty line, you find several million Americans living on less than half of the poverty line, unable to afford healthcare access, unable to afford food, unable to afford stable or safe housing, unable to buy even basic school supplies for their children. When you see those numbers, and then you hear the stories of those people in poverty, suddenly, the economic anxiety starts to make more sense. Because for the people at the bottom of the economy, they're not wrong. Their lives are heading in reverse. If you're a white, high school educated American, very specific demographic, white with no more than a high school degree, your life expectancy in the last decade hasn't just risen at a slower pace than that of other demographics, it's actually gone down. It's gone down by about five years. Now, that creates an extraordinary stress if people's lives are actually getting truncated to the extent that we're seeing now. It hasn't happened in any other Western democracy. The only other modern example 
of such an implosion of life expectancy is the Russian and Ukrainian populations after the Soviet Union disintegrated in the late 80s and early 90s. For that demographic, life expectancy is going down, access to health care is going down, <coughs> opioid addiction and overdose death is going up, suicide rates are going up. Is it any wonder that that particular group in particular was very, very susceptible to the politics of fear and the politics of anxiety and the politics of demagoguery? Now, one of the things that has fascinated me about this is how it plays out on the ground. There's a Yale political scientist called Jacob Hacker. He has a term for what's happening. He says it's a great risk shift. That even though on average we're getting wealthier as a society, we're doing so in such an unequal way that for tens of millions of Americans, they're not seeing the benefits of economic growth because those benefits are going up the economic ladder to the very, very, very top, top 1%, top 0.1%, top 0.01%, to the millionaire, 100 millionaire, and billionaire class. But the further down that pyramid you go, the less you see economic benefits occurring. If you're in the bottom 20% of the economy, your real wages peaked in the Nixon era. That's a long time ago. I was in diapers in the Nixon era. Now I've got gray hair. That's two generations ago. And in between, for the last 45 years, year in, year out, that bottom quintile has seen its real income go down. And the next quintile up has seen its income pretty much stagnant. So for the bottom 40% of people in this economy, at best, they and their families have been running in place for the last four and a half decades. And at worst, their standard of living has been imploding. What does that mean again on the ground? Well, when I was reporting the book, I met a man called Matthew Joseph. Matthew Joseph lived in Stockton, so not too far south of here. He was middle-aged, worked as a metal worker at a local factory. He's also a deacon of a church. And Matthew Joseph had a house that was worth a fair amount of money prior to the housing collapse, and a house that, after the housing collapse, was worth about 30% of what it had peaked at. So he was underwater on his mortgage. He couldn't refinance. Recession comes, Matthew Joseph loses his job. And he has nothing. He says, I went home and I curled up in a fetal position on my bed. And I began to cry. Because I didn't know how I was going to take care of my family. When I went to visit Matthew Joseph, it was an extraordinary sight because he was living in a suburban tract, the development of which had just ground to a halt as the recession had hit and the housing crisis had hit. And you saw overgrown lots which had never been built. You saw street signs peeking out of these overgrown lots as a sort of aspiration for what might have been before the recession. He said to me, look, I've never seen so many garage sales in my life because all of my neighbors have lost their jobs as well. And all of them were underwater on their mortgages. And so they were all selling things off. Not so they could fund a kids' school outing or something like that, but so that they could pay their housing bills. It was an act of utter desperation. That was Matthew Joseph in Stockton. I went to New Mexico, a tiny little desert town in the south of New Mexico called Anthony. And I met a couple that had this lot of land. And they had a mobile home, and they had a storage unit. The recession hits, they lose their jobs, can't make the payments on the mobile home, mobile home gets repossessed. So they move into the storage unit. It's unventilated, it has no windows, it's damp, it's cold, because even though it's the desert, deserts get cold in winter. It has no electricity, it has no gas. They're cooking on a propane stove, which is a desperate fire hazard. And in the center of the room is a wicker chair. 
There's a hole cut out of the wicker chair, and underneath it is a chamber pot. And at the end of the interview, I said, look, that's your American dream. And the woman looks at me, and she says, my American dream is that one day, we will have enough money to be able to live in a house with a flush toilet. This is the wealthiest country in the world, in the 21st century. And there are people so poor, they cannot access running water or electricity. I went to Appalachian, Pennsylvania, old mining communities, Trump territory. I interviewed a woman called Luan Prokop. She was middle-aged and an accountant. She had a fairly decent income. She was earning fifty to $60,000 a year. And in that part of the country, on $60,000 a year, you can live very well. The recession comes, loses her job. Sends out her resume everywhere. All over her part of Pennsylvania, then all over Pennsylvania, then all over the country. Can't get any job. Nobody's hiring. She cashes out her savings, cashes out her retirement account. She can't afford to make her house payment, so she falls into arrears. She takes her kids out of all the extracurriculars, dance, everything else they were involved in. She starts skipping meals. When I met her, she finally had found another job. You know that the job she found was in a community centre with a food pantry attached. And it paid one third of what her previous job had paid. And the only benefit of it was that she got free food every so often from the food pantry. But her chance of retiring was shot. Her chance of stability was shot. For the rest of her life, she was going to be playing catch up. And her story speaks to a broader problem, which is that even though, and it, this also speaks to why you can have 4% unemployment and 14% poverty, even though the economy has created a lot of jobs in recent years, many of those jobs now pay poverty wages. And most of those jobs pay less than the jobs that were lost before the recession. You want to know where the anger comes? The anger comes from people who feel cheated by a system they have no control over. The anger comes from feeling that they played by the rules, they did what they were supposed to do, and at the end of the day, they ended up poor and insecure and looking forward to an old age of destitution. That's enough to breed anger in any country at any time. Final story I'll give you about the people I met were some kids in Las Vegas, North Las Vegas. I know almost everybody here probably has been to Las Vegas at some point. It's on a farm. You go, it's easy to get to from California. You go to the casinos or the theater or the bars or the restaurants. You have a good time. How many people here have been to North Las Vegas? A handful of you. Very different. It's only three miles from Las Vegas Strip, but it could be a world away. They're desperately poor, really gritty. Got a lot of unemployment, a lot of very hardcore poverty, addiction, halfway houses, and so on and so forth. I went to a really big public high school there, Rancho. I think it's the largest high school in Las Vegas. And I was talking to the principal about poverty, about the difficulties his students experience. And at some point in the interview, he said to me, look, you've got to meet Angela Rokiaga. She's our full-time homeless counselor. I did a bit of a double take. The reason I did a double take is I've been to a lot of schools around the country, and even schools with problems. I've never encountered one with a full-time homeless counselor. I'm used to principals telling me, look, you've got to meet our math teacher. He's really creative. He knows how to teach really well. You've got to meet our arts teacher. He gets the kids doing all kinds of wonderful things, or so on and so forth. Very rarely have I been told, you've got to meet our full-time homeless counselor. So Angela Okiaga is there, and she says to me, look, when the recession first hit, we had about 20 or 30 homeless students. This is a school with about 2,500 kids. And then the year after that, we had about 50 homeless students. And then the year after that, we had about 100 homeless students. And then, in 2011, when I interviewed her, she said, we have 200 homeless students. 8% of our students are homeless. 
That doesn't mean they're all literally living on the streets. Some of them were, but a lot of them were couch surfing from place to place to place with their families. A lot of them were living in church basements with their families. Some of them were living in vehicles with their families. Well, some of them had some kind of housing, but it was deeply unstable. And they'd been homeless a month before, and they could be homeless a month from now. And she said to me, look, what chance do these kids have in life? What equal shot do they have in life? They have nowhere to do their homework in the evening. They have nowhere to go home and have downtime and watch TV in the evening. They have nowhere to eat a hot meal in the evening or a breakfast before they come to school in the morning. How are these kids conceivably being given an equal opportunity to succeed, to make it in the American economy? And I think it's absolutely true. When you've got the kinds of inequality we're seeing today, and the kinds of ingrained poverty we're seeing today, an awful lot of people, as a result, are being essentially told they're disposable that their dreams are less valuable than other people's dreams, that their lives are less valuable than other people's lives, and that society isn't willing to make that effort to see that they have a fair shake, a fair chance in life. Now, when I started writing my book, I went to somebody I'd known for a few years, a guy called Marshall Gans. Anyone here work with Gans? I'm seeing some people nodding. So Gans is a wonderful human being. He must be in his late 60s or early 70s now. He cut his teeth back in the 1960s here in California. As a farm worker organizer, he was working with Cesar Chavez. And he spent his entire life working on organizing, on the front lines of organizing, and community building, and resistance. When he was in his 60s, Harvard finally realized, this man's brilliant, we should hire him. I'm sure I'm missing a few chapters in between, but at some point, somehow, Gans ends up at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, teaching leadership studies and community organizing techniques. And I thought, all right, who better could I talk to when I'm starting a book on poverty than Gans? So I flew out to Boston, I went out to Cambridge, and I sat down with Marshall and began talking. I said, Marshall, I'm writing a book on poverty. He stopped me, he said, no, you're not. Which was strange, because I had a contract, and as far as I knew, I was writing a book on poverty. <laughs> And Gad said to me, let me tell you a story about the miners' canary. He said, all right. So he told me a story about how for thousands of years, human beings have been going down in mines and mining coal and metal ores and so on and so forth. And for most of that human history, they didn't have gas monitors or any other modern scientific monitoring equipment. But that didn't make the mines less dangerous. Miners knew that they were at risk of asphyxiating. They knew they were at risk of dying in explosions. And so they developed a series of sort of ad hoc techniques for dealing with the risk and trying to minimize the danger. And one of the techniques was they would take canary birds down with them in a little cage. And the reason for that was by trial and error, they found out that canary birds are really sensitive to gas. And they're also really talkative. And that's a very, very handy combination if you're a miner. Because if you've got that bird down with you, birds chattering away, Tweet, 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 as people do, or birds do. Tweet, tweet, tweet. And suddenly that bird stops. You look over. Bird is sort of lying upright, dead. You don't know it yet, but your atmosphere has been compromised and you need to get out of that mine as quickly as you possibly can. The Gan said to me, this is what American poverty in the 21st century is. It's a warning sign the atmosphere has been compromised. It's a warning sign the economy has been compromised through inequality. It's a warning sign the political system has been compromised. That things aren't working the way they're supposed to be working. Now, as soon as you frame it that way, it's hugely liberating. And here's the reason. If poverty is the equivalent of a natural disaster, or if you're of a religious mind, a God-given tragedy. Nothing much you can do about it. If poverty is just the way things are, some people are going to be unlucky and they're going to just end up homeless or hungry or 
lacking access to doctors or lacking access to employment and there's nothing really anything can do about it. Well, then what you do is you raise your hands, you shrug, maybe if you're feeling charitable you dip into your checkbook every so often, write a check, make yourself feel better, give it some worthy cause like the Salvation Army and then you move on, you get on with your life. But if poverty isn't a natural disaster but it's a cause but is a consequence of human action or inaction, of a deliberate compromising of our political and our economic environment. Well, then there are things we can do about it. We don't live in a failed economy. We don't live in a system where there are crop failures caused by plagues of locusts or by uncontrollable droughts. We have more food being produced in this country and produced cheaply than any other country on earth. We have a glut of food, and yet we have one in six Americans who are food insecure. We don't have an economy that is entirely ground to a halt, but all its problems is generating jobs. And yet, we have one in six Americans nearly living below the poverty line. So what's going on here? Well, I think one of the things that's happened is over the last half century, our political system has become increasingly insensitive to the existence of poverty. We went through a good moment in the 1960s when a man called Michael Harrington, social justice activist called Harrington, essentially embarrassed Lyndon Johnson's government into creating a war on poverty. It was very effective. Over a 10 year period from 64 to 74, a series of anti-poverty interventions, nutritional programs, educational programs, job training, housing, healthcare access expansions, reduced America's poverty rate from 22% down to 11%, the single most rapid decrease in poverty in American history. But Johnson kind of framed the issue wrong. He didn't say, I'm going to do my absolute level best to get rid of poverty. What he said is, I'm going to end poverty. You can't do that. If you frame poverty like a moonshot, there's no halfway to the moon. You either get there or you don't. If you frame a poverty war the same way, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because as long as some people remain poor, or homeless, or addicted, as long as some kids go to school without adequate supplies, or without shoes that fit, well, if you claim you're going to end poverty and people still see evidence of poverty, a lot of people are going to think we're throwing good money after bad. And that's sort of what happened. By the mid-70s, we lose patience with the war on poverty, even though, by many measures, it was successful. And from then on, from the mid-70s to today, at best, we've treated poverty as an afterthought, but more often, we've treated the poor as being to blame for their poverty. Why are you poor? You must have smoked the wrong drug, or injected the wrong drug, or slept with the wrong person. Why are you poor? You must have failed educationally. Why are you poor? You must have been profligate. You must not have saved enough. We've treated it as a disease of an individual, as instead of as a holistic societal problem. And as we've taken our eye off the ball on poverty, more and more, those who can have locked themselves away from the consequences of poverty. So the higher up the economic ladder you are, the more likely you are to privatise every aspect of your life that you can. You don't want to see poor people in your neighbourhood, hire private security. You don't want your kids to go to school with poor people, that's easy, you send them to private schools. You don't want to have to deal with the consequences of a collapsed infrastructure. No worries, go to the best private doctors you can afford. Use the express lanes on the highways that allow you to pay to avoid traffic, and so on and so forth. And so for 45 years, we've managed to underplay the consequences of poverty. And now what's happened is all of this is leaping the rails. All of the enmity created by poverty, all of the insecurity, not just amongst the poor, but at least as much amongst the affluent, that is created by an unequal society, has been unleashed. All of the rage 
that poverty or fear of the poor generates has coalesced. And all of these streams have come together in our current political moment to pave the way for demagoguery. Now, I know I'm running out of time here, so very quickly, what do we do about it? Well, in the same way as Gantz's argument is liberating because it shows you how to understand the problem, it's liberating because it allows you to put forward solutions. If we're poor, not because we lack resources, but because our economic priorities are wrong, we can fix that. If, at least in part, we're underinvesting in job training and nutritional programs and education for kids because of tax cuts for the wealthy, that's easy. Let's restore a progressive tax system. If, at least in part, we have so many people homeless because we have underinvested in public housing or in affordable housing, let's reinvest in those structures. <coughs> if, at least in part, in places like the Central Valley, kids are suffering health-wise and education-wise because their water is contaminated and they're getting too much lead and too much arsenic and too much pesticides when they drink water, let's fix it by investing in public infrastructure again. Now these seem to be the challenges of our moment. We can either cede the ground to demagogues and say, look, we live in an era of inequity, we live in an era of poverty, we live in an era of anxiety, there's nothing we can do about it apart from hunker down and wait for the storm to pass, and watch as Donald Trump and his minions demolish every pillar of civil society. All we can say enough is enough, that we're a wealthy, dynamic, creative society. And we have the abilities to get people health insurance. And we have the ability to get kids housing. And we have the ability to provide living wages for people so they're not working 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week and still be counted as amongst the poor in America. And if we do that, I hope and believe that one day this Donald Trump moment will be nothing but a bad memory. If we don't do that, the risk is that our new normal will be Trumpism or variants thereof. That's not a world I want to live in. I suspect that's not a world any of you here want to live in. So I guess where I'll end is, let's roll our sleeves up, let's get to work. Let's create a slightly better vision of the future than the one we're being offered at the moment. Thank you very much. So the question is, how did this happen? And I assume when you say this, we're talking about the slide to Trumpism. How did this happen so quickly? And I guess how I'm going to respond to it, I don't think it did. I think if you look at some of the forces I'm talking about, and, and some other ones, which I address more in, in the upcoming book, but let's talk about some of these other ones. 911 at least unleashed an absolutely extraordinary level of anxiety and fear in this country. And some of it was very rational. We, we'd suffered a very big, very visible terrorist attack. But the way it played out, the way it was amplified, especially in the emerging social media environment, made what was a manageable single event look like an unending catastrophe. And you started seeing opinion poll numbers. And my, my next book is concerned with how we misappropriate risk or misunderstand risk. You started seeing in these extraordinary opinion poll numbers in the months after 911, where upwards of 25% of Americans, and in some polls up to 50% of Americans, were convinced that they were likely to be themselves victims of a terrorist attack in the next 12 months. Now, if you do the maths on that, 
to get up to even 25%, let alone 50% of Americans being direct victims of terrorist attacks, you would have had to have over 75 million American casualties in the year 2002. As it happened that year, there were none. There were the, the, the absolutely appalling events of 911. There was the anthrax attacks a few weeks and months later. There were the sniper shootings in Washington, D.C. And then there was this period where there were no domestic terrorist attacks. So if you look at that, 75 million people think they're directly at risk of attack. None actually ended up being victims. There's a mismatch. And you can see the same with, let's say, Ebola would be another case in point. At the height of the Ebola epidemic, more Americans responded that Ebola was the number one public threat in America than thought that poverty was the number one threat. Ebola killed five Americans, I believe. Now, not just that. If you look at where Ebola was centralized, it was in three countries in West Africa that almost no American civilians traveled to. They're not tourist destinations. If you go to that part of West Africa, the chances are you're going as a medical worker, an aid worker, you're going to build a school. Very few people go. At the height of the Ebola epidemic, somewhere in the region of one in five Americans reported they were changing their travel plans. Now again, there's no reality behind that. It's fear, unbridled and unmanaged. And I think that that's the sort of thing that you have to add into the economic mix, this sense of unbridled fear, the echo chamber that social media creates and that we don't yet know how to sort of navigate smartly. The rise of very polarized media that fails to distinguish between fake and real news events and increasingly an audience that does not have the ability to distinguish between fake and real news events. Put all of that into the mix and it starts to make more sense. But very, very quickly, I don't think this happened overnight. I think trends were there at least since 2001, which is how we tolerated the slide to torture as a normal practice of American democracy under George Bush. Could not have happened in another moment in time. But we somehow went down that road where torture became just something we had to do. We knew about the torture scandals. And then we still re-elected George Bush in 2004. And I think we just cannot overestimate the damage that did to our political culture. So in a way, it's possible that Obama was a sort of extraordinary exception during a 20-year period of cultural and political crisis. Yeah. I, I totally agree with your analysis of, of the issue. What scares me is uh, how much money the 1% have and how they're able to more and more control elections. Now they're, they realize the demographics are going against them, so they come up with this voter suppression thing. And uh, whether we can continue to deal with those issues. So the question is, you know, what do we do about voter suppression given that the economic elites have sort of made it de facto policy to tan down the vote? Well, and that's just one example <laughs> the gerrymandering yeah. and everything else. All right, so we have, we have a, a very carefully controlled political system at this point that the 1% has an outlandish influence in. I think that's true to a, a large extent, and it's a huge crisis. And obviously, one of the things that anybody concerned with the survival of democracy in this country is going to have to get a handle on is how we register people to vote, how we protect that registration. If people are going to pass laws saying, well, you've got to present a driver's license or other form of photo ID, we've got to have freedom summers that get people those licenses. In the same way as 55, 60 years ago, there were people going into parts of the country where it was official policy to deny African Americans the vote through any means necessary, and somehow finding ways to get those people back into the political system or into the political system. We're going to have to do the same thing. It's not a clean fight. It's not a fight I thought we'd have to fight in 2017. I thought we will, we will be on that. But we aren't. As a society, we seem to be right in the middle of a new era of just grotesque voter suppression. So we're going to have to get active and counter that voter suppression on the ground and get people out into poor precincts teaching people how to register to vote. Um, a broader question, though, or a broader response, I don't think the 1% is happy in the slightest with Donald Trump. I think they can get away. I think they think they can get away with Donald Trump and still get their taxes reduced and still get the regulation and all these other nasty things. But Trump himself as a persona, I suspect, scares the elites as much as he scares everyone in this room. 
Because even though the, you know, at the moment the stock market is booming, if you have the most powerful man on earth, as irrational as he is, and I don't mean left-wing or right-wing, I just mean irrational. You know, if you have a guy who seems to be quite capable of blowing up every relationship America has cultivated over the last century, and I say this quite seriously, he's in the last six months at least undermined America's relationship with Australia through an extraordinary phone call with the Prime Minister, he has berated the German leadership to the point where Germany can hardly talk to the American leadership anymore. He has tweeted insults to the mayor of London within about 30 minutes of terrorist attacks hitting London. He has completely pissed off the French political establishment by already endorsing Marine Le Pen to be the leader of France. He's almost in a sort of verbal, he's in a verbal war, he's almost in more than a verbal war with the European Union because he's made it clear he hopes it's demolished. And NATO doesn't trust him because he can't really articulate a collective defense thing. So if you think that, at least in part, America's leadership, its elite, its 1%, needs international stability and needs alliances, that web of soft and hard power alliances that America built very, very, very carefully over 100 years, he's put a sledgehammer to every single alliance under the sun. So my suspicion is that behind the scenes, that 1% is just as keen as you and me to find a way to get this man impeached or declared incompetent if they have an ounce of rationality to them. Yeah. Sorry, my question, my answers were too long. I apologize. <laughs> I think, frankly, as you know, both uh, sobering, uh, you know, and stark portrait of the so-called wealthiest nation uh, in the world. Uh, we are just before we get going to the panel here. Uh, want to just uh, do a couple things. Firstly, I want to offer uh, an extreme round of thanks to Davis Media Access, our local media nonprofit, who is here uh, taping this live, taping this event live today and also we'll be recording it, and then we will also be uh, ready for broadcast uh, in the, within the next couple weeks. Uh, Davis Media Access has uh, been a partner with the uh, Gatherings Initiative uh, for, since the beginning, uh, several months ago, so they've been uh, uh, recording all of the events. So please, quick round of applause for Davis Media Access. Call, I'm actually going to call a panel, the panelists up here. I'm going to start to move to the edge of the stage because uh, they're going to be up on the stage. Uh, actually, you can come, come right on up if you want. Um, I'm really excited to moderate today's panel uh, where we've actually, I think, assembled some of the leading voices of activism, uh, community engagement and empowerment here in Yolo County. Uh, we're going to touch on some of the issues. Uh, that Sasha raised in his, in his talk, certainly, and also uh, some additional ones as well. Order, but I will have them all raise their hands as I. Uh, well, actually, I think they are sitting. They may be sitting in the order that we have them. See. All right. Well, starting off, uh, we have Mindy Romero. <laughs> Mindy Romero is the founder and director of the California Civic Engagement Project at UC Davis Centers for Regional, for Regional for Change. Uh, Romero is a political sociologist and also holds a PhD in sociology from UC Davis. Uh, Mindy has been invited to speak about civic engagement and political rights in numerous venues and has recently provided testimony to the National Commission on Voting Rights and as well as the California State Legislature. Her research has been cited in numerous major outlets including the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Politico and Huffington Post. Uh, a native of California's Central Valley, Romero is also active in community leadership. Uh, she currently serves as the president of the Board of Mutual Housing California. Uh, and wonderful local affordable housing nonprofit organization and is also the vice chair of the Social Services Commission here in the city of Davis. 
we'll go to uh, Ann here since Sandy stepped off the stage for a second. <laughs> Dr. Ann Kemptrump, Ann over there, is involved with the local group Davis Muslim Hands is a public, and is a public health epidemiologist who works for the California Department of Public Health Center for Infectious Diseases. Ann has also served as the first female board chairperson of one of the largest Islamic centers in the Sacramento area, Salam, the Salam Center, Sacramento Area League of Associated Muslims. Uh, Ann, of course, has also been quite long involved with Davis's annual celebration of Abraham, an attempt to increase understanding and respect amongst the major three Abrahamic faiths in New York County. Uh, we have Sandy Holman right here, is the founder of the Culture Co-op, an organization she developed to assist people and organizations working with equity and diversity in education, businesses, and the community. She has served as a consultant to countless organizations locally and nationally to help meet the needs of diverse populations. She's also committed herself to advocacy for children and education. Uh, Sandy has an MS in school counseling with a focus on education from California State University, Sacramento. She served on the board of directors of local and national agencies serving youth and adults, including the Youth Services Task Force, the National Dropout Prevention Network, Center for Regional Development, Progress Ranch Group Home for Emotionally Disturbed Children, and YOLO Unite, an organization serving youth in the community. And Kate Laddish is a longtime Winters resident, previous professional incarnations as a geology professor, editor, and ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Um, Kate also writes for the Winters Express and the Davis Enterprise, and, uh, and most folks in this community may also know her as a musician, uh, one of her other loves, and as a member of the Puda Creek Crawdads. Aud but more recently, Kate is also a founding member of Democracy Winters, which is a nonpartisan network of volunteers working in Winters, California, in West Yolo County, to preserve democracy and uphold constitutional freedoms through uh, community outreach and local, state, and national political activism. So please welcome our panel. Six questions that have been pre-submitted to the, uh, the panelists. Uh, we are going to ask one question of each of the panelists, and then uh, two of the questions we'll ask all of the panelists to respond to. And then if we have a little bit of time again, we'll also open up for uh, our Q&A from the audience as well. So um, question number one, this is for all of the, all of the panel. Uh, so post-November 2016 election, um, emotions running very high in this country. Uh, there has been an energizing and increased engagement of community members uh, here in uh, Davis, but also throughout our region. How do we sustain that energy moving forward? Uh, whoever wants to start us off? And thank you so much to Lucas, Don, Tracy, and everybody else, and Gloria of the Phoenix Coalition and you know, Gatherings Initiative for, for inviting all of us and Sasha Abronsky. Oh. I'll get closer to the microphone. Thank you to Lucas, Don, and Gloria, and everybody of the Phoenix Coalition, and Tracy uh, of the Phoenix Coalition Gatherings Initiative for inviting all of us, as well as Sasha Bromsky, and, uh, and putting on these forums. So after the November election and then the inauguration, there was obviously, for many of us, an outpouring of concern and the need to do something. And speaking for Democracy Winners and many of us in this group, that it was something where either we could just be at home freaking out and not feeling very effective and overwhelmed, or we could try to band together. And so, and when we get to the part about democracy winners, I'll talk about, about that a bit more. But in terms of, I, I think part of the question is how, how to sustain this. And that's a great question. And if anybody here has a fantastic answer to that, I'm all ears. I know it's something that we've been working hard on a lot. We had a huge outpouring at the beginning. And now that we are five, almost six months into this, it's tricky to, to try to figure out how to sustain this. We can only be in panic mode for just so long, as the neuroscientists in our group have pointed out. And so it's something that we're trying to address with establishing social connections uh, between, uh, between members of the community and within the group to try to continue and to play to strengths and identify the key, the key areas that we can be active in. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging my elder, my grandfather, who was wiser than five PhD holding individuals uh, in anyone that I know. And uh, I just want to say right away, one of the things that you're, we're all going to have to do is massive self-care. I'm seeing people stroke out, have heart attacks, all kinds of things right now because of the stress of all of this. 
And on that note, I want to say, and I don't say this disrespectfully, this has been going on for people of color for centuries. A lot of you are new to this kind of dynamic, but this is not a new thing, as Sasha was saying. In fact, it goes back way more than decades. It goes back centuries. And what we're experiencing right now is what I call a, a fascist uptick in things. But for black and brown folks, it's been horrible forever. So staying in your lane and knowing what your part in this is essential. We need to learn from people who have been going through this since the inception of our country. And one of the things that we know is all of you have a gift, all of you have a special proclivity towards making a difference in a particular area. So you need to stay in your lane or you're going to burn out. You will burn out, you will get sick, you will stroke out, you will have high blood pressure, you will not be able to sustain this if you don't do those things. Um, learning from groups who have been through this is paramount. A lot of the groups I feel a part of, they're hurting right now. They're hurting because they feel like they have not been acknowledged for what they've been going through for centuries, that now that only because this is hurting mainstream culture so much, all of a sudden it's been a legitimized problem, and there's a hurt to that. But there is a lot that all of you can learn from that. They've been there, done that. They've learned some lessons. We know what does not work and what does work. So you need to be consulting with traditionally, historically um, oppressed people of color who have gone through this forever and a day. And I, and I don't say that disrespectfully, I just want to be real with you. The other thing is that we need to be strategic. You cannot just be going to every movement, going to every march, although those things are really important things to do, but you need to be strategic and focused. For example, if I'm into the political scheme, we know that you need to be focusing on things like gerrymandering. Our districts are drawn so, drawn so crazy, it's gonna be hard to change uh, people who are in office. You need to be focusing on how we do our funding. There needs to be public funding for candidates who are running. Are always there's going to be a skew towards the wealthy being able to get into office. You need to be focusing on the electoral college, for example, that is very, it was based on slavery when they were trying to com 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 I'm sorry, compartmentalize slaves and what they counted. It is an antique system and it should be the popular vote that's putting people into office. So we need to be strategic. I'm just giving an example and visionary when we do decide what our focus is going to be and do the research and again, learn from people who have been doing this so that, that we can implement that. And then we need to learn about systems of oppression and how they work. So this system, this whole country, it's been a continuum. I'm not surprised by Donald Trump. This just did not happen with Donald Trump. If we're thinking that way, we need to change that way. There's been this slow escalation for a long time and really genocidal tendencies towards certain groups for a long time. So we need to realize that just because he got in, uh, this is not when all the problems started. It's been a slow uptick climb that now we have this big old ugly zit that is out there and it's just popping, but it's been a zit forever. <laughs> A hard act to follow, and, but a lot of very, very powerful messages in there. Um, you know, I was going to say that um, coming from the Davis Muslim Hands, I mean, the Muslim community has been trying to do this outreach from 9-11, um, but we're babies in, in comparison to the, the work that you folks have been doing. But you touched on something that I think is very important in keeping up that uh, momentum and that, and that is, you know, while we do create new organizations to fill a specific need, it is really important to build these partnerships. So actually this kind of organization that we have today where we can touch base to other organizations and say, oh wow, I could work with you to do that. And so then, you know, you, you, you're not going to lose yourself in that other organization, but you're going to build um, together on those, um, you know, the strengths that they have. So that's what, uh, I, it's basically an echo of, of a lot of the things that obviously your experience speaks to. Thank you. Well, first off, I'll just say thank you. Let me know if you can hear me. <laughs> thank you uh, for, for uh, inviting me here today, and it's great to be here and see a, an engaged group and a large group, right? Um, what would I add to everything that you've said? Everybody's touched on so many important things. So I think what I'll add, and this is going to sound a bit negative, but bear with me, <laughs> uh, is just to keep in mind just how hard this is. 
So engagement, sustained engagement, is difficult. And if we look back at the history of social movements in this country, for all those that we can think about, there are so many, many others that didn't get off the ground, or got off the ground and then burned out, or were crushed or trampled, right? Um, and so it's a difficult thing just to get something off the ground. And what we see now with a growing uh, set of groups, right, and marches and different types of engagement around the country, that's exciting, right? No matter what your politics are, it's exciting to see engagement, period. Um, but at the same time, so that's right there a huge hurdle, right, that we've, we've gotten that far and it's visible and it's numerous and it's in the media and people are talking about it, right? Um, at the same time, it's gonna be very difficult to sustain, particularly when you're going up against a system, right, where every element of that um, is, is really built um, not to necessarily hear or listen to social movement, right? The only thing that our system is guaranteed to somewhat listen to is voters. And even then, we know that folks in political power, elected officials don't always, for various reasons, always listen with all due respect for the elected officials in the room. Um, <laughs> but for a variety of reasons, they don't always listen to voters, or at least not completely to voters. So um, the difficulty is there. And when we look at voting numbers, um, I do a lot of research on civic engagement more broadly, but particularly voting. Uh, the disparities in turnout, low turnout, were one of the lowest uh, turnout nations in, in amongst established democracies, period. And then when, of those who are voting, it, it, there's a great deal of disparity across income, across educational age, um, race, ethnicity. And those disparities are entrenched. They are. If you look back over the last 30 years, the gaps in comparable elections, presidential to presidential, midterm to midterm, very little has changed, actually. Right, there's some bumps, we a little bit better year, disparities were reduced, but only by a small percentage point, and that actually includes 2008. It was a good year, but it, still we had a great deal of disparity, and we had a lot of folks in this country who were not represented, and certainly not fully represented, but not represented very much at all. So when we think about 2018, I know a lot of folks in this room are thinking about 2018, right? <laughs> I have heard, and I've been asked this by, huh? Counting the days. Counting the days. Okay, so I say all of this, in the end, the punchline is not to give up by any means, but it's to work that much harder. So I've been asked a lot about 2018. I did a lot of you know, media um, interviews and things like that. And the only cautions I hear from a lot of folks that will assume, well, gosh, it, in 2018, if you're of the mindset, which I think everybody is, it seems to be here, um, that there needs to be a change, and certainly in 2020, um, a lot of folks are assuming that's almost a given now. Right? They're figuring out what to do in the meantime, how to fight the battle, but they think that, gosh, there's gonna, with all this right, percolating, everything that we see, there's gonna be a, 20, a change in 2018. It's gonna be an uphill battle because of the demographics of who votes in midterm elections, and even in 2020. Now, we may not get to 2020 in terms of Donald Trump, um, because of many of the investigations that we see happening, but still the larger dynamic that extends beyond Donald Trump um, is difficult. So. I think what that says is there's power in numbers also. So we need greater numbers and we need, include. what should we be doing? Inclusivity is absolutely critical. So there needs to be a common narrative that everybody can, can believe in, that everybody can come together around. Um, and don't forget that there's framing and there's narratives on, if we're gonna make this about one side versus another, on both sides, right? And one of the reasons why um, if you're unhappy with Donald Trump as president, why we have Donald Trump as president is because there were a whole lot of efforts on that side to get to voters, to frame it as, I think in one of the things Sasha was talking about, was this us against them, us against the poor, us against those of color, right? us against whatever the threats are right? that were, that were framed. Um, so there's a framing battle on this side as well. And on the progressive side of things, it's difficult, it has historically been difficult to frame a clear narrative Right, that gets an inclusive group on board, that power in numbers, and just in closing, there's so much to say. <laughs> um, is there, there, we have to reach out, and we not only have to reach out, I would argue here, um, with those in different socioeconomic status and different race and ethnic groups, we also have to reach out by age as well. 
And I don't see a whole lot of young people here. Actually, that uh, that's a perfect segue. The next question. The next question. Okay. It's actually for Mindy. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, which is, if you would please tell us a little bit more about the work of the California Civic Engagement Project, but also, uh, are we experiencing trends related to youth involvement and engagement? And if so, what are the driving changes and what can we expect? Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit about um, the California Civic Engagement Project, because the latter half of your question is a lot more important. <laughs> so uh, we're a research center on campus, um, right, just a little bit of ways away from here. Um, and we do research on civic engagement, a lot of work on voting behavior, um, and we do a lot of outreach with that research. So we're not on the ground in mobilization campaigns, but rather we are disseminating our research as widely as possible and working with folks at the policy level to the local level, whoever can be empowered or can use data right, um, in powerful, hopefully, hopefully powerful ways. Um, we do a lot of work with, um, we particularly pay attention to underrepresented groups, period, underrepresented in our civic and political landscape, and that means we do a lot of work with young people, young people of color, but young people, period, as they are very underrepresented in every election, and they are very underrepresented in our civic um, structure. So I think you were asking me what kind of some of the trends that are happening. Yes, exactly. Trends related to youth involvement or engagement. Yeah. And also what is, what's driving those changes, if, if anything at all. I don't know if I would frame it as trends, but um, just kind of, I guess I'll just say what's what's happening with young people, period. Um, so when you look at voting numbers, and we do hear a lot about, we heard a lot about this after November, right? Um, it, if you look at just the straight turnout numbers of young people, they're very, very low. And I'll actually skip that conversation because I think many of you are aware of, right, that narrative is out there. There's a framing around that narrative to explain it that says that young people are just apathetic, oh, what's wrong with this generation, they just don't care, look at the numbers, right? Something that I um, have to navigate as a researcher when I release those numbers because I don't want people to take those numbers and think that young people are apathetic or we just give up the, you know, give up the, it's a, it's a bad investment, right, to work with young people. Um, and electorally because they're not going to participate. Now there's actually so many reasons, many, many reasons why young people don't participate. They're in a system that really suppresses their vote, that doesn't encourage them to vote, that doesn't give them the tools to vote. But I'll, I'll put that aside for the moment. More broadly, even with those low turnout numbers, that's not the full story um, in terms of their broader types, the broader types of participation that young people are doing and how they feel about um, the world around them. So I, I think many of you probably work with young people, right? Hopefully. Um, and young people are very engaged. They very, care very much about issues in their communities and in the broader world. They're pretty darn informed, right? Um, but statistically, they're very likely to be progressive, right? Um, and they don't get a lot of credit for that. But more importantly, they're not being supported in that right to encourage, to be encouraged further in that work and also be transitioned into voters. So a lot of young people are doing so much in care, but when it comes to casting a ballot, they don't see why casting a ballot is an actionable step on something they care about. I'm gonna go out and join a movement, I'm gonna go clean up a park, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z tangible, real things that I care about, that I know is gonna make a difference. But why is voting, right, something that's gonna make a difference? And a big part of that is a belief in institutions, and I actually would have included this in my other answer, my earlier answer too. Um, we're struggling right now with a lot of, um, young people are very much, but I say the broader society, with a lot of distrust in our institutions. Particularly, right, this is, yeah, particularly a electoral system, but beyond that's why voter suppression efforts and the idea of fraud is so um, concerning. But even more broadly, do you trust the political structure? Do you even trust the civic structure? Do you trust your local government? Um, and that's a very real thing. And for a sustained movement period, for people to think that they should get out and do something in March, or get out and talk to their local elected officials, or whatever it might be, you have to believe that the system is actually, that the system cares, that that actually is something that, that's a pathway to, to change, right? You have to believe in it. If you think that doesn't matter, that you're not gonna get anywhere, that route, then you're gonna completely check out. So believing in our systems really matter, and young people um, believe and care about their world around them, but they have a difficult, they're having a greater time statistically in caring about their institutions. And again, there's very real reasons for that, uh, which maybe we may or may not address later, but um, that's the challenge, is reaching out to young people, 
um, helping them, show them how to vote, show them how to get engaged, tell them the why it really matters, and then you can connect young people to the, to the greater structure, yeah. No, oh, thanks very much, Mindy. Um, the next question is for Anne. Uh, sadly, we've continued to see an in, uh, increased instances of hate, intolerance, and even violence, uh, including, I think, you know, we had anti-Muslim and immigrant rallies, anti-immigrant rallies in Roseville yesterday. Uh, we had a uh, uh, you know, hate-motivated uh, murder recently up in Portland, Oregon, on a light rail train. Uh, considering all of these incidents, can you please tell us what you think are some of the concerns and hopes and fears uh, that might be specific to the Muslim community in the Yolo and Sacramento region, and how can the average citizen be a stronger ally? Um, thank you. So I'll take a brief moment to talk a little bit about um, who is Davis Muslim Hands, because we're a very new organization. I look at my watch, let's see. Uh, <laughs> um, but we're really in the process of being registered as a nonprofit entity. Um, and we're founded by members of the Muslim community here in Davis, and our mission is to uh, promote cross-cultural and religious awareness within these diverse communities we live in um, in order to help establish a better society where individuals love, respect, and accept each other as they are. So that point is basically our goal is to be a resource to the community uh, to provide um, outreach and uh, information and uh, events in which people can uh, come to us and we can go to them. So in response to this question, I have to speak from my experiences and from uh, those of friends and family, particularly within the Davis Muslim Hands. So in other words, I can't speak for the Muslim community. And that's because there isn't such one big monolith that has a mindset, because they are so amazingly diverse in culture, practice, national origin, and faith trajectories. So our, really, our mosaic provides a lot of nuance, but I'll try. So speaking about some of these concerns and fears, um, one is um, it is really exhausting, and particularly for our youth who have to spend so much energy just growing up than to be constantly on the defense of a religion that we love or in pain to see the ongoing slaughter of Muslims who indeed it is Muslims by far who are most affected by um, the extremism we see. So one reason we formed this organization is to help free our youth to develop themselves as youth to study to do what they need to do so that we can contribute to a safer space for them. Um, Another thought is that we know from the experience of the mosque vandalism um, and individual stories um, from students who have been targets of hate, uh, like one Muslim female student who got a, a bag of dog poop apparently dropped at her door, um, is that there are people who fear and even hate Muslims in this community, um, yet will not reach out to understand. So our challenge here then is how can we reach these folks in order to address their fears and misunderstandings before they act on them. And then I wanted to talk briefly about the um, refugees coming from Muslim countries, more so in Sacramento, but some here as well. And this has actually brought a, brought a pretty big resource challenge to our institutions, our Islamic institutions. So we welcome them with open arms and have to find creative partnerships, and again, building on this partnership idea to manage all these issues that they bring. So we are tremendously grateful to the many refugee organizations and other faith-based organizations who help out. But we do have hope. Um, we have had two recent events in Davis that give us all hope. So um, in face of the vandalism, the outpouring of the community support from all levels was amazing. Um, we had close to 1,000 people in Central Park the Friday after the vandalism, and um, the mosque received financial support from the community for repair. I mean, that is an incredible place to live that that happens. It really speaks a lot about this community. Um, secondly, we had a community interfaith iftar just celebrated last week here with similar enthusiastic turnout. So most people in this community want to share and delight in the cultural tapestry uh, we can find in Davis, so this is very wonderful. Um, the other aspect that brings us hope is that from negative event comes uh, motivations for us, Muslims, to do more. Um, and that's creating these outreach organizations and participating in the interfaith events and other organizations. And so um, the positive is that we're doing more. Um, and how can the broader community be a stronger ally, which is a, it's a beautiful sentiment and question. And I, I really think education is the biggest factor. 
Um, stereotypes and myths about Islam really come from believing in too much of the new spin and not taking the time to understand how we got to where we are in the first place. So how many of us really think about the impact of the 19th and 20th century colonialism in countries of Muslim faith? And we're really experiencing the negative reverberations of that today. So can we as Americans step back and look more at the global view of how we got to where this we are today and away from this immediacy of the wars and um, understand our whole situation as a global responsibility is what I think. Um, and so I've actually provided um, a bibliography and suggested websites. There, my husband's um, waving them up there, so feel free to come by and, and pick up a copy. And if I can just touch on the last thing, I want to talk about that, mo that motto you see in the, the see something, say something motto, you know? I would like to just say that extend that to motto to all acts of intolerance, whether it be towards Muslims, African Americans, LGBTQ, any marginalized community. So don't allow the online troll to go unanswered. Answer him with love. And, and, you, um, and I want to finish with a tribute to those brave men who gave their lives to stand up to that man spewing hate towards a Muslim woman and her African American friend. Those are the true heroes, and those are the people that make our country great. Thank you so much, Ann. Yeah, you can feel free to clap. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Sandy, and Sandy, you touched on some of this uh, in your sort of opening comments, uh, but you know, certainly as you referenced previously, many communities, and especially uh, communities of people of color have faced institutional challenges uh, and discrimination, certainly for not only generations, but as you said in your opening statements, for centuries. Uh, how is today any different? Uh, what hope exists for stopping or reversing these agendas that perpetuate inequality now and in the years ahead? Okay, I want to go through this quickly because this is a very profound question. Um, for uh, communities of color, again, this is not different. What you all are experiencing, what mainstream culture is experiencing, what women are experiencing now, it has been profound, deeply genocidal for generations, across generations. And I want to um, touch on something that Sasha said very quickly. Not only is this an economic thing that's really hitting uh, what we would refer to as dominant culture, but it is a framing of what is good and evil based on the darkness of one's skin, which is why I wrote that book, Grandpa is Everything Black Bad, and which is why a lot of people are able to be manipulated in their hate and their isms, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobism, Islamophobism, and so forth. And we need to really understand that until we address this sense of darkness being cast as a horrible thing, um, people are going to be able to be manipulated. And I'm saying that because I feel a lot of people voted not only because of their economic uh, pocket, which is something that was very difficult for them and certainly was affecting them more than ever in their lives before, and I'm referring to dominant culture, but they also voted based on keeping those others out, those others, whether they were Muslims, blacks, and so there was this dis-ease in their mind in that some brilliant person said, and I can't remember her name, they may not feel they're a sexist or a racist or any of the other things, but they felt comfortable voting for someone who clearly was putting that forth. This is important to understand as we go forth and strategically try to address problems. If we do not address the isms that are going with this, and particularly colorism and having darker skin in our world and our country, we're never going to make progress. And this is going to keep cycling and has it's done. I want to say that one thing that's different now, too, is we have more research about what works and what doesn't work. So we shouldn't just be jumping into things without a strategic plan and really a focus and understanding the ideology of hate. There is actually an ideology of hate and elitism and so forth. And if we don't understand it, our solutions are only going to be um, half efficient. And because dominant culture is being affected more right now, it's like all of a sudden we're supposed to care because white working men and women are not, uh, you know, their pockets have been hit. We should have been caring as a common humanity, regardless of who was suffering in this country. As I said, it's been for centuries. But it does create a unique opportunity to forge collaborations and partnerships that can be powerful. And that's something that's different that's going on right now. People with privilege are now understanding that you can't just think about yourself, that eventually when you have snakes coming out of the pit, and I'm talking about rattlesnakes, they will eventually start to turn on each other. So we have to work together as a humanity. 
you have to care for me or that black man that got killed by a police on camera that a lot of time that we try to justify, well, he stole the candy bar, that's why they shot him. Or he didn't put his hands up enough. Even when we're seeing these things on videotape, it creates a disease and a dis-ease in the mind where we have to rationalize not doing anything so that we can still feel good about ourselves and we have to address this and address it honestly. The other thing is that we need to understand because we frame things against race. And race is that big elephant, elephant in the room that we don't want to talk about. That they are able to manipulate systems of oppression, divide and separate people. That way we won't work with each other because we're fighting over crumbs. And that is something that we're going to have to come together as a common good to fight. I believe that love has to be the center of this. Even as I'm saying these tough things to you, I am known as a love person. And I'm saying these things to you in love because I want to be real with you if we're serious about changing things. So you need to understand, for example, that this system, this theory of darkness, and you being less than because you are darker, or you come from a certain neighborhood, is something that is perpetuated by oppressive systems. So when a, a, a person who's been in prison, who's white, has more of a chance of getting a job than someone who's black with a degree, that says something to you. My time is going by very, very quickly. Church burnings have been going on nonstop. You don't hear about it in the news. It's not only mosques, it's not only temples. They are burning churches like crazy. And so I just want to say what's different about now is we have a unique opportunity to be strategic, learn about systems of oppression and how they work, forge partnerships together, and go to our brothers and sisters, black and brown, who've been suffering forever to say, what can you teach us? How can we do this differently? How can we truly make a difference? And Trump is just a symptom. He's not the problem. Yeah, he's the problem too, I'm sorry. But he's, he's, he's a symptom of us not addressing the sin, and I use the word sin, that has been going on forever for a lot of targeted groups. And we need to stop that, because what eventually affects one will affect the total. That's what I've been taught. When karma goes out to others that we ignore, it comes back to us, and that's kind of what's happening now. But I'm hopeful that we can make a difference and that we can change things, and by working together and, and on the power of love and learning and teaching, reading those books, reading, hearing speakers, speaking to our elders. My grandfather would say, y'all need to get busy and learn, that we can make a difference. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is for Kate. Uh, Kate, you're representative of a newly formed community group, Democracy Winters, that is doing work. Certainly, you can explain that from the beginning uh, out in Winters, but also Western Yellow County. Uh, if you please tell us a little bit about it, and then also uh, why does it exist? But also, how are you able to successfully bridge different perspectives and factions within the community? Uh, and, and I think this will help to you know, shed some light on not only what's happening in Winters, but also this with some of the nonprofits and other organizations, community organizations that exist here in Davis and other parts of the region that are experiencing the same issues. Thanks, Lucas, and I appreciate the optimism of the second half of the question there. Uh, we'll get to that part. So Democracy Winters uh, is we are very newly formed. We're, as a group, and many of us as individuals, we're, we're babies at this and would really like to learn from Sandy and other people who've been, who've been activists for a much longer time and have a, a much deeper understanding of it. So for, I, I do feel like for, for me to be up here in, in the guise of something of an expert is a little bit of a misnomer. The only expertise I have is as somebody who became very active very recently. And so it might, uh, a number of you might relate to that as well. So we started on January 21st when Bonnie Dixon, if you want to raise your hand, handed out a flyer at the Winters Women's March describing Democracy Winters as a network of volunteers working locally in Winters, California on a number of issues. And by saying that, she made it so. And uh, there we now have, we had our first meeting a week later. We have a mailing list of 75 people, which is 1% of the Winters population. And, uh, and uh, with people active in a number of different ways. So what we are, really quickly, is we are, in fact, a network of volunteers in Winters and uh, working uh, to preserve democracy and uphold constitutional freedoms through community outreach and local, state, and national political activism. Our cliff notes is that we're nonpartisan as much as we can be, pro-democracy, anti-authoritarianism. And a lot of our focus has been uh, looking at corruption in government and preserving the constitutional rights of different minority and targeted groups 
in our community and more broadly, and uh, the need to act on many of those concerns. So in terms of what do we do and, and how are we organized, we don't have a particular leader. Nobody in the group was planning on forming and leading a group at this particular time in our lives, but there, there was a need to do something now and, uh, and enough collective energy for people to come together and do it. And so we have a steering committee, many of whom are here today, and uh, the general membership meets a couple times a month, but we have a, a pretty extensive communication network. What is it we do? There's a lot of organized calling, and I see Indivisible YOLO is also here. Uh, I think they do, they do many of these, these items as well. And so we have organized calling of, of elected officials at the local, state, and national levels. We are able to mobilize people to turn out to rallies and town hall meetings. We're able to go to uh, meetings at the local and county level and to follow some of these different different issues. We write letters to the editor about particular issues so that there's public visibility of issues and so that people get the idea that they aren't the only ones who may be concerned about something. And we've also been able to establish lines of communication with elected officials at different levels of government and their staff. And since we're able to speak as a group with that, it has a bit more clout than any one of us just going individually. And so that's something that we've, we've had some, some real success with. Some of, of what we've done in terms of trying to, uh, uh, with the second half of the question, with the bridging the different, the different uh, opinions with, within the community, we're working in Winters, and Winters is a small town with a long memory. And so, uh, touching on something that Sasha said at the very beginning of his talk with, with uh, if there's somebody with whom you disagree, do you start, what level of opposition do you start in? And something that we've talked a lot about is how do we do that in a small town where people are going to remember that. And so we've been able to work with forming connections rather than confrontation when we're working within Winters. When we're looking at issues coming from the administration, our, our tone is probably different. I'll just say, and uh, or our, our approach. Uh, we've been some of what we've been able to do is uh, I worked with Supervisor Don Saylor, uh, and Don and the head of IHSS came into my apartment building. It's all seniors and people with disabilities to get people plugged into a program. Most of the people in my subsidized apartment building probably have different voter, uh, different voting uh, habits than I do. <laughs> And so that's, that's the, the idea with that being is that it's something where we're able to work with people with a lot of different ideas, but on particular issues where many of us have common concerns. And, uh, but then we've also been able to work, many of us turned out when um, an organization at the Hispanic, Winters Hispanic Advisory Committee was very involved in a Winters Community Proclamation of Winters Community Values and Affirmations. And so we were able to turn out for a city council meeting and able to speak to it. And many, many of the people who were, going to, uh, who were most concerned about this for very personal reasons weren't comfortable coming to the meeting. And so we were able to go and speak and the Winter City Council uh, passed a very robust version of it unanimously. And so that's an example of something that, that we've been able to do as a group, as a very new group that's working across, across some different, different areas. Thank you so much. Final question is for the entire panel. Um, and Sasha had referenced, uh, uh, and actually spoke at length about actually about the war on poverty uh, that was sort of uh, uh, taken uh, taken on during the presidency of LBJ. Uh, and many of the programs uh, that were started during that time with food stamps, what is now known as Supplemental Assist uh, Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, many others. Those all seem to be under attack. Uh, you know, there is a increasingly a fear that nearly every one of those sort of social programs uh, that deal with social services issues, but also even environmental programs, uh, may be subjected to the chopping block. We've been hearing those certain those threats, uh, but it seems like increasingly there may be some reality to that as well. Um, are there any ways that the nonprofit or the faith communities might be able to step in to help preserve programs, or perhaps other possibilities as well? Uh, this is a question for anyone on the panel or all the members of the panel. Uh, and actually, Sasha may also have uh, a response to that as well, too. Uh, and then we will uh, we'll, uh, 
give to anyone some final thoughts after that to everyone. So go ahead and put it in. Okay, I'll just very quickly, I just want to say the faith community, and I do have a faith tradition, I believe in a higher power, and I like to honor the fact that many others do, has a tremendous opportunity to take the lead and make a difference. Right now, so many people think that uh, we are hypocrites, that we don't care, and if you read, whether you're reading the Quran, the Bible, whatever particular thing you're reading, all of those disciplines call for you to act on love, to be a voice for the oppressed, to help the incarcerated, and so forth. So I think the faith community and nonprofits together have a tremendous opportunity to uh, kind of rebuke all the stereotypes that are being put out there. I am not very happy with elements of the faith community who have who seem to just be having this kind of empty faith where they're doing the opposite of what their own uh, words uh, their own readings tell them what to do, but I think they have a tremendous opportunity. And also, I just want to reiterate the power of love. I do believe in the power of love, action, and strategic vision and purpose. Not that lolly love where we don't talk about truth and we don't acknowledge that we have differences and all that. I'm talking about that love that takes strength and uh, purpose and putting aside our fears to say, you know, I may be nervous of you because my mind's conditioned to think people who look like you are bad and I need to work on that, but I want to work with you because I know that this is fundamentally wrong. And it's going to take nonprofits working together with the faith community to start to put a dent to this and with individuals like yourself who really, really care about what's happening in our communities. Systemic change is insidious and very hard to change. And when I look at what's going on right now, and I think about what my grandfather, my dad, and others before me, and what they were dealing with, it's just a shame that in 2017 we're still dealing with this. But I believe that, like Martin Luther King says, you know, justice arcs up, even if you can't sense it, and we still have a responsibility to try, even if we're not making any difference um, that seems to be happening. But that love, is critical, that love and self-care. So I want to encourage you to do something, regardless of what that is. Um, so yeah, I do believe that um, faith-based and NGOs do have a role to play in um, you know, part of making that, that, that safety net. Um, there is a food bank in Sacramento, a Razak food bank, that um, was created to be able to provide halal food for um, um, needy Muslim families, but they also make a point to reach outside the faith and to supply to others because that is not only important, you know, to supply them, but to show, you know, that that we do work across that. Um, but I think what's important to know is that that they're they're part of the solution. We can't look to them as the solution. Is oh, we can count on the NGOs to take up the place where the government gives off because not everybody is involved in a faith. Not everybody is involved in an NGO. Some of these um, faith-based approaches have been exceedingly, have been very successful in their, in their areas. So what that can also do is to actually bring a model to local government and to say what worked for that. Um, and I know we have some good programs here in Yolo County um, that works with local agriculture to feed and um, really capitalizing on the system that's in place. So I think my bottom line statement is, yeah, we have a role because we can lead the way um, focusing on our specific needs and provide that information, but I think it's a partnership uh, with the larger government. I don't think we can give them a pass on that. I think I'm thinking along similar lines. Um, so definitely a role to play. Um, Faith-based community has been playing a role, right, um, in, in this country and certainly in this community uh, in trying to to bridge that gap, to, to, to provide that safety net where our government has never, ever fully, um, obviously, taken care of every one of its citizens or its residents. Um, at the same time, though, um, I get nervous with, uh, with the narrative anywhere near to say that the faith-based community can, it's their job to do this. Um, because much of um, the framing that is out there, you know, to justify um, cuts to social services, um, says that it isn't the role of government, it isn't the role of, you know, your tax dollars, but it should be faith-based community, it should be families, it should be the parents that are taking care of those kids, or it should be the, the, the adult children that are taking care of, of their older parents, or whatever it might be, right? Um, so it's, it's 
the narrative out there is to try to put that responsibility back in the community, and it often it's just, it is a justification um, for dismantling further our social safety net that we have, right, institutionally. So it's very, so that, knowing that, knowing that, it makes me nervous to, <laughs> to talk about. But I, one other thing I'll add is, um, I was talking earlier about inclusivity, and I, and just to be clear, I wasn't just thinking about like-minded folks, but reaching out to like-minded folks across race and you know ethnicity and age and so forth, socioeconomic status, but also reaching out to others that don't, right, that aren't necessarily, or at least that we think aren't like-minded. And I think that's absolutely critical because ultimately, to get change, you have to change the voters, right? Um, that voted one way, if it's the, the way that you didn't want them to vote, whatever the case, or whatever the issue is. Um, and so you have to reach out and you have to change minds and you have to break down um, the, the, the narratives that are out there. And I think the faith-based community is an absolutely critical part of that, an actor in that. Because they hopefully are, right, working with folks across ideologies and political affiliations and social locations and so forth. And so they can come together and say, we should be helping, right, um, or fighting, or this is why this is wrong, or this is why this is critical that we take a stand. Um, so I think that, that's something that's always on my mind when I think about uh, faith-based community. It's just an important, very powerful player in that. And while we're passing the mic here to Kate, uh, Sasha has also indicated he's interested in answering the, the question as well. So, so, go right ahead, Kate. So since Democracy Winters is this network of volunteers, I can't speak too much, as much to the faith-based or to the, the NGO nonprofit. Uh, but our, our approach in terms of, of concern about, about federal programs and regulations and protections that are threatened, that's where we actually most closely follow the indivisible playbook. And many of you are probably familiar at this point with the indivisible guide, whether you've read it or gone to their website or you've just heard the word indivisible an awful lot in the last few months. Uh, and this, this for us has been very helpful with that for ideas for how to interact with our elected federal representatives. So with, with Representative Garamendi and with Senators Feinstein and Harris. And it has, for us, it's been good tips about how to effectively talk with them. Who do you call about which issue? When do you do it? What's the, what are the important pieces of language to get into that conversation? And, uh, and also things about you don't have to just call or email. You can go to their office whenever you want. And a number of us are in the last few months, uh, who knew? Uh, you go in and, and it's really, it's an amazing moment of democracy to walk into your congressman's office and they greet you by name because you have actually interacted with them before. And so for us, it's establishing those, those paths of communication and, uh, and then getting information from people who know more than we do about, uh, about what to do once we've established those lines of communication. Yeah, and I guess all I'd like to add is, I'm, I'm not particularly religious, but I do come from a long line of famous rabbis. And I know that rabbis and imams and pastors have spoken out over the centuries about poverty. But I also get worried, and you talked about this, when we sort of say, oh, it's just the responsibility of the faith-based communities, and we can, we can ignore our secular responsibility as well. Um, when I was growing up, I had a postcard, and I can't remember who the quote was from, the postcard said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And when I asked why the, food ha why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. <laughs> and I do worry that if we just think about salvaging from the wreckage as a sort of act of charity, a you know, religious mitzvah, that if we just regard it as a sort of charitable good deed, that we're missing the structural problem here. Um, nobody talks about funding the Air Force or funding the Navy through church sales. We just don't talk that way. We don't say, oh, if you want a new airplane to bomb somebody in the Middle East, go and you know, have a church sale. But we do say, you know, if you want to fund schools adequately or if you want to keep the poor people fed, have a bake sale. And I think we've got to think a bit more systemically about what's going on here. Um, and the very final thing I'll say is, you know, obviously, Faith based is a part of it, and individuals are a part of it. But I think state and local government at the moment have a huge role to play. We saw this last week with Jerry Brown, he did something marvelous. Federal government abdicated all responsibility for the environment 
And Brown essentially said, all right, we're confiscating the environment from you, we're in charge now. <laughs> and I suspect over the next few years we can see this again and again and again, that combination of faith-based groups, other groups, and state and local government is going to say, you can't do it, give it to us, we'll do it. You can't get people health insurance, we'll go for single payer. You can't give people food, we'll set up our own nutritional programs. So that's just my theory, that it's sort of all of the above. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. We have just a few minutes left before we go to the sort of last portion of the event today. So we'll take uh, just a couple quick questions. We got a question right here in front. So actually, we'll do Alan first, Blue, and then we'll. Um, I understand that, that the deep switch of the problem is values, and we have to have a deep discussion. I mean, and also understand the people on the other side who want to run their values and why they have a real conflict. So we started this thing with a discussion about this is what changed values, so we really never have a deep discussion about values. And I think it's a really deep discussion for the important stuff. For example, the value of loyalty. Are we loyal? And I think that's important because basically the vote is a community of loyalty to the institution. So basically, it's important that we're defending the institution who's defending the constitutional values which are all these threats. I tried to pass an American flags at the, the farmer's market, and the mayor of our city would not take them until uncomfortable with it because it was a symbol. Why are we loyal to America? And let me question also the loyalty. Uh, we had this discussion about why should I vote because it's not going to make a difference. What is your comment? And I heard another interesting discourse we saw on the, on the stage here. I heard Sandy talk about, we've been fighting this thing for years, and I'm not sure it's making any difference. And I I'm not sure, uh, it, it's a, so the question is, how does a, loyal, a young person feel loyal and committed to her, even the vote, much less participate in all the other activities to change the system? Okay. Yet we hear that that dialogue, that basically, and then we're going to have a discussion about values and Davis, okay. values in our community. Overdue. When are we going to have a discussion about values in the Davis, in the Davis community? So that's the question. Uh, Dan, you want to take a uh, stab at that question? I, I, think, I, think uh, I think it's a good point. By the way, I want to reiterate that I do think it's made a difference. My ancestors have made a difference. I'm going to say that first and foremost, so I'm not saying it didn't. But I do think it's important to have a discussion about values. But when you come to that table, you need to be prepared that people's value system is based on their generational history and what's happened to their particular group of people. So they may not mesh with yours. So having this discussion is critical. And what do what whose values are the ones we're supposed to adhere to? Are they yours? Are they mine? Are they the group that's coming together? But yes, I would agree with you. It's important to have fundamental discussions about values and what they mean and why one, one person may have this set of values and another person may have another. And the reason why I have my values is no less important than the reason why you might have your values. And we need to listen to that. That's how we're going to grow. You're talking about courageous conversations that we are not having across race, across sex, across gender, across a variety of values that people have. That's part of the challenge of what's going on. So I think it's a good point. He wants to answer that. And then we've got, we'll do time for one more question. I saw uh, there was a question, I think Mr. Carson back there. And we'll go on to the uh, we'll wrap up. Yeah, no, I think it's very important as well. And I can see you feel very passionately about it. And you should, actually. I, um, I will say, you mentioned something also that I had said about um, young people. I was saying young people are feeling disconnected and feeling like, why should it matter? Um, and we can't blame them for that because of so many things that are kind of placed upon them that make them feel that way. But that we, hopefully, Right, should be reaching out to young people to change that. Um, so in terms of values, I, I, I think, I mean, I agree with you, just to take an extend what you said a little bit further. Um, we have to have that conversation. It is a discomforting, uncomfortable conversation, period, and it will be for many folks, and I bet you. And it has to be carefully facilitated, <laughs> lots of ground rules, but I think it is really, really important. But I think you also have to be very, um, very aware that there's going to be what you think are the values of Davis are not necessarily going to be the values that come up. You know, it's just there's going to be a, a spectrum of things that I think we like to think about ourselves in, in our community. And this is a wonderful community and generally a very inclusive community. But there are, there's a lot of variation, I think, in terms of how people view the world that we may not always be aware of. Um, 
and reaching beyond our community and reaching to other groups, right, and to find common ground, I think is very, very important. And we can talk all we want inside Davis, and we have a lot of powerful folks in Davis that do reach out and do amazing things, but we have to be talking to others. And in this state of California, we like to say that we're a blue state, but we're really shades of blue and communities of red. And we don't do a very good job of reaching out to those communities of red, really, right? Um, and I think that's part of the discussion, is finding common ground and learning to work together, um, not just because of what's happening nationally, but also to, to create a better community, communities across our state. But it's, a, it's, gonna, it's gonna be difficult. People are gonna also, I think, find, a, find things that they don't like about their community when they hear it. Thank you very much, I think. Uh, Dan, what you have a question back here, and then we're gonna wrap up and go to the next uh, segment. So I, uh, I'm Dan Carson. My question actually is aimed mostly towards you, Sasha, but I welcome anybody's response. Uh, my, my wife and I walk through sinks in some very struggling neighborhoods in the middle of the Hillary. And I, it just after the election, this really hit me that Hillary had a great economic message talking about gender pay equity, and minimum wage, and child care, <coughs> But it, my pick on it is she did not talk enough outright about the job. She had a, a green job uh, initiative that was great, but I don't think it was enough. Um, and I, I can't help but think that if you had, if she had come out for a Marshall Plan for Appalachia and Rust Belt and communities that are struggling like Stockton, whether we might be living in a very different world right now. Uh, because I think you create hope for people, I think, that combat the hate that we're doing. That's actually what I'm doing. I'll take a crack at it, but with the caveat that I never was and never will be a spokeswoman, a spokesman for Hillary Clinton. So with that caveat, um, I don't disagree with anything you said. I think she ran a very cautious campaign and she shied away from big picture systemic solutions. She actually had a lot of very sort of interesting technocratic solutions that were buried in her website. But in an age that was being defined by emotion, which is what the election became, um, she was not necessarily the most effective candidate. That's just my impression. Of, you know, I actually also spent quite a bit of time on the know. And that was my impression, that she wasn't emotionally connecting in a way that needed to be sort of part of the discourse in 2016. Um, in terms of big and bold, I think, you know, I'm half English. I grew up in England, and I've been absolutely fascinated by what's been unfolding in England the last week. Because everyone said Corbyn is electoral suicide. He's way too that way, and his proposals are way too big and bold. Nobody's going to vote for him. There's going to be a Tory majority of 200 at the end of progressive politics for a century. And I'm really not, that's not hyperbole. That's how... Everybody I know, I know a lot of people in politics in England. And that's how they were talking about it. And in the end, all of that acquired knowledge turned out to be nonsense. And um, Corbyn came within a whisker of bringing down the Conservative government. I wish that whisker had, you know, <laughs> I wish there wasn't that whisker there. Um, but I think that the message there is you can go bigger and bold because a year earlier, Britain had voted for Brexit. And everyone said that's the Donald Trump moment in England. And a year later, you see Jeremy Corbyn's politics of progress and inclusivity and tolerance actually coming near to political power. So I would agree with you on that. I just have to say that since you mentioned um, the British election. And it looks like, guess who was a big player? Young people. I'm just going to say that, because I have, you know, I'm talking about how low the participation is here historically in the U.S. And it was low for the Brexit vote, and there was a lot of blaming young people. Why didn't, because they, clearly they felt differently, but they didn't vote, right? They voted, but they just voted in lower numbers. Now it looks like that there is up to maybe uh, 20, it's just exit polls are, are difficult right after the fact, but up to maybe 20 percentage point jump from where they were with the Brexit vote and then the vote last week. So that's really powerful, and I just wanted to give the credit that the youth vote can have a huge impact. But they connected it to something that was real and tangible, and they were mobilized, and they're like, oh, we want to, we need to make this difference. So it was, it was reaching out to them that way as well. Oh, and, and they were mobilized and outreached to by, by the, um, the labor campaign and by Corbyn as well, so. And I just wanted to say one of uh, what Sasha just said, 
So when we get to the level that we are with, uh, for lack of a better word, for the sake of time, where we're in a crazy state of being, nothing is predictable. So trying to be rational with people th that you think if you present evidence and everything that they're going to change things and understand and feel differently, those rules don't apply when we're at this state of emotional upheaval. I want to say that to you. So you'll have moments of what to you seems like sanity and the moments that how in the world can we even be thinking about this? That's all typical of a chaotic environment and system and countries, which is the world is seeing right now. So there's just not a lot of predictability. I wanted to say that, except love. <laughs> <laughs> all right, with that, we will uh, we'll move on to the next uh, portion of our program. Let's one more big round of applause. For Invite folks to now uh, do two things. First of all, stand up, stretch a little bit. Uh, you can visit Supervisor Don Saylor. He's already found the snap and drink table over there uh, in the corner. And then also make sure you visit all of these different around the room. There are a bunch of different booths uh, from environmental organizations, Sierra Club, Cool Davis, uh, Culture Co-op, Davis Green Coalition, uh, Yolo Culture Resolution Center, Empower Yolo, Invisible Yolo, ACLU, uh, Statement of Love is here, Sister District Project, many, many groups. So come on, come down, and uh, take a chance and visit, get involved. Thank you very much. <laughs>